Wonderful. Uh, just a quick clarification so that you know, I am originally from Sri Lanka, uh, but I can proudly say my son-in-law is from Chennai. <laughs> so that's a good one. So I get my upam and tangal and pongal and all of that good stuff <laughs> regularly. <laughs> So, um, yes, I started life, I was a terrible student. Um, I started my life as a blacksmith trainee. I worked in a foundry. I repaired tea machinery. Uh, so I, I'm a hands-on engineer that happened to go and get a PhD somewhere. I don't know how I did that. Uh, I was a research scientist, so if we, some of you are engineers uh, here, or probably most of you. How many engineers? Lots of them, right? So my specialty is fluid mechanics. Uh, so when you fly on your plane next time, and you see the wing that flaps in and out, my PhD is actually on vortex breakdown on the aircraft wings. And uh, we took that to oil and gas. I spent uh, 11 years in Venezuela working for Shell, where we took that technology into pipelines. And so there's a whole, so I have seven PhD students who took their PhD under me. But yet after all of that, in 1999, I made up my mind to focus on decision making because I saw Shell was making disastrous decisions. So the last 20 years, this is my passion. Uh, for some of you who don't know, this year I'll be 76 years old. And I still teach eight hour workshops. So there is the inspiration for you to really be dynamic and get it done, right? Uh, so listen and interrupt me anytime. Ask any questions and make a note. I'll have my contact information later on. Reach out to me, connect on LinkedIn. Uh, I have a philosophy. I never charge money for consulting private individuals. Only corporates pay. Any personal problem you have, you can LinkedIn me, WhatsApp me, Skype me. My time is always free for individuals, okay? Uh, cell phones off, please, if I may suggest. I'm sure for another 45 minutes you can live without it, right? Uh, so how many of you would give your car to a mechanic who is not trained? Anybody? No, right? Would you go to a dentist who's not trained? Almost certainly not, right? But the question is, why not? Well, because he's going to screw up your mouth and your car. And also, do you agree that somebody who's trained would do a better job? Yeah. yeah. So then what about people who have not been trained in decision making? Are they not likely to screw up somewhere down the line? Huh? Well, I know at Shell, we made not million dollar screw up, billion dollar screw up. I mean, serious stuff. So decisions at the top are the worst because the impact is huge, right? So first, let's talk about problem solving versus decision making. There's a misconception here. Uh, by the way, I do have a few books, not a lot of books. Uh, we sell it for just 350 rupees. If you want to buy one, feel free, right? Everyone has solved a problem, but the big question is, do we understand what is a problem? Well, the problem starts with a symptom. So let's assume you have a child, son or a grandson or somebody. Whenever he or she run, he runs, let's say the the, the ankle gets swollen. So now you see the symptom, then you say, you go to a doctor who looks at you and say, oh, I know the problem. His arch is slightly deformed. Oh, doctor, what shall we do, please? And the doctor says, well, you can wrap it up, you can put it on ice, you can spare special shoes, or you can even, we can operate if nothing works. So now you think, what do I do? I can't do all of these things, right? <laughs> so you say, I'm gonna wear shoes. We're gonna give shoes. So, of course, the mama says, we'll put on shoes, and the papa says, well, why do you decide on shoes? You've got to validate that decision, and I'll explain to you later. And finally, you have to implement it. Otherwise, nothing's going to happen, right? So as you can see, there are six steps to solving a problem. But there are two important steps, four and five, which is what we are about. Because, ladies and gentlemen, problem solving is not decision making. Problem solving is unique to the domain expert, to the person who is going to do it. So the IT guy can solve his own problems, the bank guy can solve his own problems, the, the mason can solve his own problem. I cannot do that stuff. But decision making is unique to the person who makes the decision. So if you're a young boy here, I can't find a spouse for you, right? I can find five of them and leave to you, but you have to decide, right? So the better way to explain this is, imagine after work, touch wood, nothing happens, that you go to, you go uh, home. On the way home, your car flashes that red, red light saying service engine. And you say, oh boy, what is this? So you quickly take your car to gym, your mechanic, 
and say, hey, Jim, what's the problem? He says, don't worry, sir. Let me run the diagnostics. So he runs the diagnostics and comes back and says, sir, you have a gear train problem. And your natural question is, hey, Jim, what do I do? He says, look, sir, I can repair it, but I can't promise you how well it will last. We can put a reconditioned unit. And if that fails, sir, we can put a brand new unit. And why do you contemplate on it? He says, sir, we can even sell your car. It's knocking a few years. Now you start thinking, why are so many options available? Can Jim decide what to do? He solved your problem. He told you what the options are. He doesn't know that your daughter just got married and you spent, I don't know how much you spent in, in this country. Really, you know, <laughs> You borrow, you take loans to spend on weddings, you pay forever. That's another story. Or you have a daughter in the university that the daughter can run. So there are many reasons that does Jim know all of this stuff? Yeah? No. No. So what did Jim do? He solved the problem. And you have to make that? The president of a nation or a country does not solve problems, ladies and gentlemen. What do they do? make decisions. Are we now clear that there's a distinct difference between the two, right? So because of that, I'm going to show you a one minute video on what has happened in the real world. sound out for you guys on this one. Uh, <laughs> I'm at maximum sound. I think on my side. I'm trying to keep the mic here if I can. If anybody has a question, anything, my background or whatever it is. No questions? Yeah, that would be better if you can tell me your journey and the whole started. Yeah, yeah. As I say, I was an absolutely useless student. I worked as a mechanic and nobody thought I was ever going to make it. But then I realized suddenly that the theory had a lot of value. So since I was very poor, hilarious, but I quit and told my uncle, my auntie, to find me a rich girl that I would marry her and she would there was pay for my journey to England. I was crazy about going to England. I'd pay any price, it doesn't matter. But that didn't happen, but somehow I managed to go there. Uh, my first degree was in mechanical engineering. Uh, I did graduate as valedictorian, so I didn't do a master's degree. I went straight to a PhD on a full scholarship in the UK. And then there was a student was doing his PhD from Venezuela, who told me, hey, why don't you come and teach? So I said, what do I teach? He said, no, masters and PhDs you can teach, but it's the English, no problem. So I went, I sent my wife to Sri Lanka, and I went to Venezuela, and guess what? Due to political reasons, they shut down the MSc and PhD programs. They told me to go back to England. I said, I closed up everything. I'm not able to go anymore. What is this? Then I said, I will teach bachelor's degrees. Then he said, but that's in Spanish. I said, don't worry, I'll learn. You might not believe this, but in 77 days, 
I learned enough Spanish to stand up in a class in the Today I'm very, very fluent in Spanish. I do translation as well. But all I'm trying to say is this. If you want to do something, you can do it. It's just a matter of a passion. So I worked 37 years in that field of engineering, did a lot of research. Uh, if you're pipeliners, there are very interesting theories, the anabolic breakdown in the pipelines and things. Then I went to Abu Dhabi, I set a strategic plan for that national oil company, at not. Then I went back to Houston, stayed 25 years there. I was with Enron, the famous company that went on. And then I realized the theory in life is, and this is in addition to that stuff, is my philosophy is learn, earn, and return. I learn, and I earn. Now I return what I learn. In the good old days, this is how great people have learned to give back to the Australian government here to take over, because at my age, I don't know how long I can go on for eight hour sessions. So hopefully she'll pick up and learn. Because the knowledge I have, I'm the only person in the world, the only person in the world that teaches analytical decision making. You can go anywhere and find and the point here is, I made up my mind, I could do it. Okay. Which means any one of you can do it. Are we good? Yeah, we're fine. Huh? Yeah, we're fine. Okay. No, no, no. Oh, yeah, yeah, that's good. Should I be like a pan-am, or will they think that judgment, experience, intuition, logic, yeah, common you. sense, etc. is the way to go? In the good old days, this is how great leaders went about their business. Of course, you don't hear of the sob stories and the fiascos. For example, TWA and Pan Am, the pioneers of air travel, are no more. Bad decisions at Kodak led to their bankruptcy. Billionaire Ross Perot admitted to two of his worst decisions for turning down early partnership opportunities at Microsoft and Home Depot, each worth billions of dollars today. In 2000, Yahoo rejected a $44 billion bid from Microsoft, and then in 2017, when Yahoo was put up for sale, Verizon grabbed it for just $4.5 billion. When startup Netflix approached Blockbuster CEO to partner with them, he laughed at the proposition. A few years later, Netflix forced the bankruptcy of Blockbuster. Coca-Cola, for example, invested millions of dollars in developing and launching new Coke, yet they were forced to withdraw it just three months after launching. So the message is very clear. is, if the likes of Microsoft, Yahoo, and all of these guys, Kodak, with excellent strategic planners, if they could mess up, what guarantee do you have that you're safe? In fact, just last year, two famous companies, a startup called WeWork, had a valuation of $47 billion, filed for bankruptcy. And the largest milk producer in the US, Dean Foods, a 94-year-old company filed for bankruptcy. So you can see whether you are a fresh boy or you're an established old man, you're both vulnerable. You're not immune. None of your companies are immune. Just take the cell phone. What it has done to the flashlight is no more. The watch, the record player, camera, the maps, everybody's being wiped out. Today, there is no guarantee, ladies and gentlemen. The decisions you make will make or break you. And that is why Marshall Goldsmith, the famous coach, wrote a book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. And that only applies to you, to the company, but to every one of you. Whatever you are there, whether you want to get married, to go overseas, change jobs, start a company, I don't care what it is, but what is guaranteed is whatever thing, expertise that brought you here is not going to get there unless you train yourself. This is absolutely true. Let's start buying some laptops. I'm sure all of you have at least bought a laptop somewhere in your life, maybe for your company or otherwise. How do you get about it? You start with some criteria, right? That's what you want, right? Let's say you're looking for a daughter-in-law for your son. You have some criteria, right? 
right? Good looks, money, dowry, education, what everything. <coughs> Laptops got, you know, hard drives and screen sizes and backlist. Is that fair? Do you understand that? Yeah. So we start with some criteria. Now you go to the marketplace and you look for laptops. So you've got the Dells and the Lenovo's and HP's. Now you was very smart, you do your Google research, all of that stuff. Did you have a question? You can't hear? That, uh, okay, let me see if I can. Can you hear me now? Oh yeah. I, and there's one guy, and I'm sure all the others couldn't hear either, but he was the only guy with the courage to. <laughs> You're gonna make it, my friend, because you have the courage to start to get up and talk. Feel free, that's okay. So, we got all of these, and then we put all the data on a piece of paper. And you keep looking at it, and you keep looking at it. What do you do? How do you decide with all of this stuff? Well, there are many ways we do. Some of us pray, right? <laughs> yes or no? I mean, we all do at some point, right? If not, we go to a fortune teller. We have all, even Nancy Reagan had a fortune teller. True, well known. Right now, if you're of course the big type, you use dictatorial methods. I'm the boss, I'm the master, we'll do it my way. And if you're kind of not sure about it, you get a group that doesn't know either and call it a team. And then you all decide together, right? If you're a judge or a police, you follow established rules. If you're an insurance company or you're the weatherman, you're following pattern recognitions. What was the trend? What will happen? What about tradition and superstition? Next time for fun when you book a ticket, if it's not online and you go uh, with the travel agent, make sure you tell the travel agent you want to sit in row 13 and see what he's going to tell you. There's no row 13. <laughs> Even Boeing is superstitious about putting it there. And all the big buildings, they don't have floor 12. They have a 12A or something. So we, we, we are superstitious whether you like it or not, right? We gamble. We like, think of intuition. We logic experience. And then we even hope if I postpone it, it will just go away. The, you ask the boss for a salary, he keeps ignoring you, maybe you will stop asking, right? And if all else fails, what do you do? You delegate to somebody else. <laughs> you don't want to be responsible. We're going to teach you analytical decision making. It's a very specialized approach and I'll show you what goes on behind it. And now of course, I don't have to ask, every single one of you think you make good decisions. I think also. That has been my biggest trouble, how to unlearn you. Because everybody thinks, I know how to make decisions. I mean, <laughs> we don't want to make decisions, we call immediately Since you asked, let me explain how to do that, if in the right way. What you do is, if it's a team decision, and we were at Shell, we used to do this. We give the material two weeks beforehand, we tell the people who are coming in, senior people, make your decision and come. You don't make the decision there, you defend your decision. That's how you get to the right decision. Not get together and Explain, uh, expect the guy with the highest pay grade makes the call. Right. If the CXO is there, he say, okay, this is what we're going to do. And yes, sir, yes. Especially in this culture, my culture also, Sri Lanka culture, you don't talk back a lot. You kind of, you know. Is it in your DNA? One of your own, by the way, is going to talk now, a video about your DNA. Dr. Chopra comes at this as a doctor, as a scientist, and a very eloquent seeker, given us so much to think about coming at it from a scientific basis and then moving into many more theories and, and thoughts. We've been able to look at the brain. We've been able to look at gene expression. We've been able to look at cell markers of aging, telomerase, telomere length, We've been able to look at what are called inflammatory markers. In other words, everything that's happening in the body at a biological cell level. 23,000 genes, 3.3 million bacterial genes. Actually, your body is more bacteria than it is uh, human cells, the microbiome. So we're looking at those genes. And then we're looking at what is called the epigenome, which is the shell of proteins 
outside the <laughs> genome and how these work together. And what we are finding is remarkable. You know, in the beginning nobody would believe us, but now we have collaborations with Harvard, UCSF, UCSD, Scripps, with digital technology, with Duke University, with Mount Sinai. We can look at a blood sample and we can tell you if you're experiencing samadhi occasionally or not, if your mind is quiet or not, if you're falling into the place where he you have that our parents experience it. Parents <laughs> too. In fact, the epigenetic shows that your experiences, your experiences now, which are not in your brain by the way. Everybody says, my experience is in my brain. No, it's not in your brain. Your experiences are not in your body. Your experiences are in a non-local consciousness, which is not in space-time. In Hawaii, they have these temples and cow farms. If a cow has been zapped electrically, the next generation of cows will not go to the fence. They already know it's electrical and they might get shocked. Okay, then the following generation. Now, people have done experiments right here where you take mice and you have them smell wintergreen, which is a very pleasant smell. Then they get mild electrical shocks. The next seven generations of mice will be scared by smelling wintergreen. Where is the seat of this personality? Where is it coming from? This is why science opens the window to what people already knew, actually, in our tradition. So there you are. It's an incredible proof that science today is actually finding out that our experiences are not in our brain. But we keep thinking, it's coming out of our DNA. So each of us, are pre-wired to take decisions and that is only possible if we had a prior experience but coming forwards when you face a new thing that DNA can't help so it's very important to realize we have to undo this thing or manage it in some way otherwise we have no choice can you imagine seven generations of mice has never seen winter green in their life but they're scared of winter green Okay, now, the next thing is how people control you. This is what I'm trying to say. You think you're making decisions. You're not, sir, with due respect. We know how to modify the environment, how to manipulate your thought, I will tell you in a minute. So you decide the way I want you to decide and you don't even know it. Just to give you a quick thing, another silly thing about my life. I used to own two big liquor stores in Houston, Texas. But I don't even serve liquor in my house. I don't even drink liquor. But what do we do? There are five shelves on a liquor store. I get a premium from the vendors for putting the bottles on eye level. So that's modifying the environment. Then others give me a further premium if I place their product to the right of the fastest selling liquor. Why? When you look at the fastest selling liquor and it's too expensive, 80% of the people are right handed. Their hand goes here and takes the other guy's bottle. That's manipulation. We know what you're going to do. So my point is, the marketers are experts at playing this game. And if you're not properly trained, you fall sucker. There is no way. Now, so because of that, I'm going to talk about a concept called persuasion, not persuasion. How we deal with you now from a different angle. Okay, so watch with me. Yes, persuasion. Persuasion is the practice of getting people sympathetic to your message before they experience it. It is what you say immediately before you deliver your message that leverages your success tremendously. There's this interesting study. A guy goes to a shopping mall in France and he tries to get women's phone numbers as they pass various shops so he could call for a date. One of them is a shoe store and another was a bakery. But in neither of those cases was he very successful. He only got a number 13% of the time. But there was one kind of shop that doubled his success rate when women were passing it, a flower shop. Why? 
because flowers put women in a mindset of romance. Not consciously, persuasive. If we are paying attention to something, that's how we decide to pay attention. But a communicator can reroute our attention to something that isn't important, but make it seem important as a consequence. Now, Mark and some of them have studied persuasion's potency. One online furniture store tested images of fluffy clouds versus cold hard cash on its homepage. Those who saw the background depiction of clouds searched the site for more comfortable furniture. Those who went to the site that had money in the background became cost conscious and preferred to purchase less expensive furniture. Almost no one recognizes that the clouds or the coins had any impact on their behavior. Think about that. Those, those two websites were identical except the background. The font sizes, the images, everything was identical. But they kept it on for three months with clouds in the background and three months with coins in the background. And people went, the clouds guys went for comfortable furniture. The coins guys, we went for cheap furniture. Yet, when they were asked, do you remember what was the background? Not one of them. The same way with the girls who were giving the phone numbers for the date. There was a guy at the other end of the mall asking the girls, did you give your phone number to that guy? If they said yes, would ask, do you remember where he was standing? And the clue. But the DNA romance was tied in and they did. So this is what's going on in your brain. Right? People are able to, so how many of you, in your small companies, if it's large, almost impossible, it's like an elephant, you can't move anything in large companies, but medium-sized companies, when you want a website, what do you do? You go and find some web designer and says, hey, these are my colored space, could you make a site? The guy has no idea of the psychology behind how websites can really make money for you. It's not SEO that makes money, it's what they see. So from now on, go back and look at your websites and ask, are we willing to re-engineer this so that we can persuade them, not persuade them, but persuade them. Okay, any questions? No, okay. We'll try one more. What we do in our experiment, we very briefly expose people to a warm or cold substance. And what we expect to happen is that that simple experience with a warm substance or a cold substance will prime people to sort of activate these uh, feelings of warmth and comfort and the things that we've learned about since we were very young. Volunteers for the experiment are asked to hold a warm cup of coffee as they are met by Lawrence. They have been primed with heat. The purpose of the experiment is to record participants' judgments about Lawrence's colleague, Randy. Yeah, that was a great day. It was awesome. Well, it's good until I got stranded in Florida what? because of the snowstorm oh. in New York on Friday. So. Come. And here's the killer question. Would you give Randy a permanent job? Based on your brief interaction with Randy, or would you hire him? Um, as a project manager, uh, he seemed like a, a generally friendly guy. So yeah, I would say so. Yeah, why not? <laughs> sure. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Saying warm and friendly things about a stranger might just be the normal polite response. Time to cool things down. <laughs> Except for the temperature of the drink. Identical conditions. The same conversation with Randy. How was your break? Exactly right. Not really. And six minutes later, the same questions from Lawrence. Based on your brief interaction with him, would you recommend him or would you hire Randy as project manager? Uh, as a leader? I'm not sure. Based on the brief interaction? No. Maybe not for the impression that I got. The experiment shows, remarkably, that a brief encounter with a beverage could see you either hired or fired. It's a powerful effect, and one that might have worrying applications. 
in the case of, say, uh, consumer products, um, feeling warm about a product presumably will make you more likely to buy it. Um, feeling warm about a spokesperson may make you be more likely to listen to that person and trust it. So, there you are. Now, that's a shocker, isn't it? Yeah. Who would think that this, is, this could happen, something so simple? So, my, my advice to you is this. If you're at a business meeting, serve a hard drink, not <laughs> And if you're on a date, order a hot soup, not a cold salad, right? So, tell your daughter and son, make sure how they handle the dates. Now, you're too late for it, right? <laughs> But when I go for meetings in the US, I strike this perfectly. About 10 minutes before I approach the office of my potential counterpart, I say, hey Joe, I'm going, I'm going to stop by your Starbucks. Can I get you a coffee, please? Well, sure, get me a coffee. What do you think I do? Hand over a hot coffee to his hand. He started to walk my way then, <laughs> right? It's a well-known technique. Use it. Don't feel that you have to ignore these things. What about intuition and logic? <coughs> Most of our decisions are actually intuitive or logic. Intuition and logic cannot go. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, it does. That's the amazing thing, because it's not about the temperature; it's what happens inside you. Right? Don't worry. Give a hot tea and a masala tea, better still. <laughs> okay. Good question. In fact, it's not the first time somebody's asked me. Many times in Sri Lanka, I do a lot of work in Sri Lanka, and they ask me the same question. But sir, it can't be. It's not about your comfort level. It's about how you are wired inside. It's amazing. Right. Yes. Oh, cool down. That's different. <laughs> Cooling down. That's not the. That's not the same thing. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah. I have no idea. This is done at Yale, so they studied it. Uh, the, you see, there are two levels of uh, studying in the behavioral world, the behavioral economics and behavioral studies. Is the one level is what goes on. Then the neuroscientists take the and try to analyze from a brain pattern what's going on. Now, I teach negotiating also, and there I talk to you about things called neural entrainment and mirror neurons. Those are very deep neural stuff that show that when we negotiate, we can make you come to our way of thinking very subtle. <coughs> so what's happened is, ladies and gentlemen, it's exactly what Dr. Marshall Goldsmith said. In today's world, what got you here will not get you there. A lot of your politicians go overseas to negotiate with the Western world. They never trained in it. The Chinese and the Japanese at the top, they train, I, I train not the highest level of diplomats, the US government's one level below, actually two levels below, at a lower level, I train negotiators. Because you, it is, negotiating is not bargaining for numbers. That's the last one. A lot of us think negotiating is haggling with the street vendor. Much, much more into it, right? If you ever get a chance, I'd love to give you an opportunity. Now, Let's talk about intuition and logic. Intuition and logic cannot coexist. You either make decisions intuitively or you make through logic. And this video is about that. He got a Nobel Prize for this. So I want to explain beforehand. He's going to talk to you about two systems, system one and system two. And it's exactly that, intuition and logic. So if I ask you two plus two, do you have to calculate? This is a mic. Did you have to think through what it was? <laughs> That's the intuitive part. So pay close attention to what happens, the difference between intuition and logic as it takes place, okay?
Giordani and Kahneman received a Nobel Prize for his work in the area of behavioral economics. Here he speaks of the two systems that we humans rely on to make decisions. At the heart of human thinking, there's a conflict between logic and intuition that leads to mistakes. You know, a lot of really two ways of operating. One is sort of fast thinking, an automatic discipline mode there. Everything that you see, uh, that you understand, you know, this is a tree, that's a helicopter, and that's the statue of liberty. First of all, the structure of all of this stuff is just a bar. The other mode is slow, deliberate, logical, and rational. It's a system too. This is the gap of the two systems that's really to put students on one side and 17 by 24 is on the other. What is two plus two? Four. Four. And what's two plus two? Four. Four. It is automatic. It just happens to you. It's almost like a reflex. And what's that? 22 times 17. So let me put that on. But when we have to pay attention to a tricky problem, we engage a slow but logical system to do all that involves work, that involves concentration. And can I get you to swap with me uh, for a second? This thing too may be clever, but it's also slow, limiting, and lazy. If you are expected to do something that demands a lot of effort, you will stop even walking. GD 9, 6, 51. Um, this fact sheet concerns this much well as Sean Bain out here. Uh, the same to guys advise the media tend to be nice things in bottom. These people think that I want to use a slow, sensible system too to make a rational decision about how much they would pay for a bottle of champagne. But what they don't know is that their decision will actually be taken totally without their knowledge by their hidden fast autopilot system one. And with the help of a bag of ping pong balls, we can influence that decision. I've got a set balls here from 100 in this bag. I'd like to reach in and draw that around it for me, if you would. First, they've got to choose a ball. And it says 10, 10, 10, 10. They think it's a random number, but in fact it's rigged. All the balls are marked with the low number 10. What we do is purposefully, we give people a first decision if it's clearly meaningless. Ten, ten. Okay. Well, should we go to play ten pounds this nice bottle of Richard Champagne? I oh, would, yes. I uh, yeah, yes. Okay. This first decision is meaningless, based as it is on a seemingly random number. But what it does do is lodge the low number ten in their heads. Now for the real question. When we ask them how much they actually pay for the champagne. What's the maximum amount you think you'd be willing to pay? Twenty? Okay. Seven pounds. Seven pounds. Okay. Probably ten pounds. A range of fairly low offers. But what happens if we prime people with a much higher number? Sixty-five instead of ten. Where's that one? Sixty-five. Five. Okay. It says sixty-five. How will this affect the price people are prepared to pay? What's the price somebody would be willing to pay for a bottle of champagne? Forty. Forty-five pounds. Forty-five pounds. Fifty. Logic does not have a window. The price people are prepared to pay is influenced by nothing more than the number written on the ping pong. <laughs> so we think we, we make decisions, right? Yeah, we do. But you're being manipulated and you don't even know it's happening. So use this technique, beware of these techniques. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what So beware of it. I'm putting this on the table for you. This is the area what I call perils and pitfalls that you face as you make decisions. Your first gut feel intuition can kill you. Now that I've told you this, let me test something. Imagine you go to Dubai. And on the way back, you bring a laptop for your son. You buy it for $800. The son just remove the laptop, and you put it on some website and sell it for $1,000. How much profit did you make? No big deal, right? 200 That is what I call system one thinking. You didn't have to calculate, right? Now let's take a look at this one. A bat costs a dollar more than a ball. If you know this, don't answer, let the others benefit. 
A barrel of oil together cost a dollar ten. How much does the oil cost? Ten. Point. Point one. Huh? Come on. Most of you said ten cents. But is it true? That engineers know back minus ball is one, back plus ball is one ten. The ball is only five cents. Yet, what happened here was, you used system one to do it like this, instead of using system two. This is what we call gravitational effect. You think you're doing system two, but you're gravitating to system one. And that's what happened to the people who told about the champagne also. They said, oh yeah, we are going to think about it. What's it really worth? But they really say, impact of the, ten, the ping pong ball. And they don't even know it. The last video I'm going to show you is another one that's used at many stores, banks, everywhere. I train a lot of these people that well, they use this thing. It's called a ghost option. Pay attention, this is quite phenomenal. Let's look at the use of ghost options to influence your decision. I'll give you a couple of more examples of irrational decision making. Imagine I give you a choice. Do you want to go for a weekend to Rome, all expenses paid, hotel, transportation, food, breakfast, the continental breakfast, everything, or a weekend in Paris? Now, weekend in Paris, weekend in Rome, these are different things. They have different food, different culture, different art. Now, imagine I added a choice to the set. Imagine I said a weekend in Rome, a weekend in Paris, what if it was a trip to Rome, all expenses paid, transportation, breakfast, but doesn't include coffee in the morning. If you want coffee, you have to pay for it yourself, it's two euros fifty. Now, in some ways, given that you can have Rome with coffee, why would you possibly want Rome without coffee? It's an inferior option. But guess what happened? The moment you add Rome without coffee, Rome with coffee become more popular and people choose it. The fact that you have Rome without coffee makes Rome with coffee look superior, and not just to Rome without coffee, even superior to Paris. <laughs> Oops, sorry. Uh, my apologies. I gotta get back here. for a moment is, imagine yourself, you're going to Bangkok or Singapore on a vacation on a holiday for three or four days or a week, and you start looking for hotels. There's one hotel that says $100 a night, no Wi-Fi, no breakfast. The other says $110, includes Wi-Fi and breakfast. What do you think you're going to pick? So that was Rome and Kha. You don't even compare anything. Your mind is like, shh. See, I, I train hire agency and I tell them, you have 200 and $250 rooms, and then you want to charge $10 for Wi-Fi? You lose the whole room because people are going somewhere else. To recover that $200, how many sales must you make? So when you price stuff, be very careful about this cost option, right? Now I'm going to show you how that is used in the other aspects of the world, right? So follow carefully. Home without coffee, even superior to Paris. <laughs> Here are two examples of this principle. This was an ad from The Economist a few years ago that gave us three choices. An online subscription for $59, a print subscription for $125, or you can get both for $125. I took this and I gave it to a hundred MIT students. I said, what would you choose? And these are the market share. Most people wanted the combo deal. <laughs> Thankfully, nobody wanted the dominated option. But now, if you have an option that nobody wants, you take it off, right? So I, took, I printed another version of this when I eliminated the middle option. And I gave it to another hundred students. Here's what happens. Uh, and now the most popular option became the least popular and the least popular became the most popular. What was happening is that option that was useless in the middle was useless in a sense that nobody wanted it. 
but it wasn't useless in the sense that it helped people figure out what they wanted. In fact, relative to the option in the middle, which was only the print 425, the print NWEB 425 looked like a fantastic deal. And as a consequence, people chose it. The general idea here, by the way, is that we actually don't know our preferences that well. And because we don't know our preferences that well, we're susceptible to all of these influences from the external forces. One more example of this, uh, people believe that when we deal with physical attraction, we see somebody and we know immediately whether we like them or not, attracted or not, which is why we have these four minute dates. Um, so I decided to do this experiment with people. I'll show you graphic images of people, not real people. The experiment was with people. I showed some people a picture of Tom and a picture of Jerry. And I said, who do you want to date, Tom or Jerry? But for half the people, I added an ugly version of Jerry. I took Photoshop and I made Jerry slightly less attractive. The other people, I added an ugly version of Tom. And the question was, will ugly Jerry and ugly Tom help? more attractive brothers? And the answer was absolutely yes. When Ugly Jerry was around, Jerry was popular. When Ugly Tom was around, Tom was popular. <laughs> this, of course, has two uh, very clear implications for, uh, for, for life in general. Um, if you ever go bar hopping, who do you want to take with you? <laughs> slightly uglier version of yourself. <laughs> similar, similar but slightly uglier. And, and the second point, of course, is that uh, if somebody else invites you, you know how they think about you. <laughs> <laughs> so next time you get an invitation to go bar hopping or party, you know what they think about you. But you know, this is so true. Uh, when I got married, early 70s, my wife, my mother arranged for me to see six girls. So I went, you know, I had come from the US, so I was in demand quality at the time. <laughs> and this is 70s, not like today's IT kids who are all over the world. There were hardly anybody went overseas. So I never realized this. But after that, about 10 years ago, I reflected on this. And I remember something extraordinary. In every case, when the prospective bride was presented, there were five or six not so pretty girls around there. So they knew about it long before we did. The science got to it, you know. Any questions? In fact, to add on, it's shown in the movies that the main hero, the main protagonist, and his sidekicks are always not so Not so good looking, right? <laughs> okay. So this is interesting of what happened at McDonald's. See, if you look at a McDonald's menu for fries, that's what you see. But in big letters, you can get a small fry for $1.39, 74 grams, $1.79 and $1.89. If you divide the small by two, that means you get 37 grams for 70 cents. But here's the funny deal. Going from the medium to large, you get 35 grams for just 10 cents. McDonald places the medium fry in the middle, which is their ghost option. Your cell phone company has plans just like that, ghost options. When you go to the bank next time, take a little time and look at the structure of fixed deposits. Certain amount for a certain period, certain amount. I've trained a lot of these guys. They put cost options for you to invest more money. That's the way it's done, right? And then, of course, I have not touched on many things called unconscious biases. These are just a small number. There is so much happening in the world. If you do not use a structured methodology, you're going to make a mess, whether you like it or not. Not all the time, but some critical decisions. So, Keep an eye on it. Any questions, please stop me anytime. Don't worry about it. You're perfectly okay to stop and ask the questions, right? So hopefully you are convinced that in today's world of big data, you're likely to make some optimal decisions. But what can we do about it? And I'm going to give you the answer. But let's first ask ourselves, what is decision making? It's part art and part science. Art is our feelings. It doesn't matter what, our feelings have to be a part of our decisions, yes or no? Yes, yes. I 
can't, we can die for you, right? Because that's your feelings, whatever you want to do. I can't buy a car for you. It's your thing, right? So feelings are important, but there's a scientific component we can add to it to manage our feelings, right? Now, can somebody tell me what triggers the need for a decision? Why do we have to make decisions? Come on, get involved. Choices. Multiple choices. Is that right? I, I have no idea. Management, management, no, it's whether it's an art. So I'm saying there are two components. So this is also again two components with art. With art and science, so both. <laughs> okay, we'll get it. So, what triggers the need for a decision? In other words, why do we have to make decisions? To grow power. Very good. Yes, sir. Anybody else? Come on, guys. Also. Yeah. And, and you know, as engineers, you got to think a little deeper. There is only one reason. Change. If nothing changes, you don't have to make a decision. Sit in a cemetery and watch, and nobody's going to make decisions in the cemetery. Nothing's changing. And that's the most important thing to understand. We make decisions when something changes. Now, change happens. The rains come, the rains go, winds come, winds go. All kinds of things happen. But we also, we get married, we find jobs, we travel, we do anything. That's our initiated decisions, right? Now, here's what the sequence is. Very interesting sequence. Whenever there is a change, there is a conflict. See, I, every morning I take my wife a cup of coffee to bed. And I've been trying to get her off sugar, you know. So every now and then I'll take the coffee without sugar. That's a change. And it's a conflict. She says, no, go get me my sugar, please. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You see, my, I'm married 47 years because of yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> there is no other way, right? Happy wife, happy life. <laughs> All ladies will believe in that. So, there is a conflict. That conflict leads to problems and opportunities both, by the way. Not just problems. Your problem is somebody else's opportunity. My son was a senior director at Yahoo many years ago, and he told me something very interesting. At Yahoo, these young engineers are very smart, very bright, and they're called in to solve a problem, and the, the VP says, you know, we got a problem and all of that stuff. And they listen to the thing, then they go away in two or three pairs to try to solve it. They find a solution, but they don't tell it to Yahoo. They resign from the company, that their own startup, and send the whole freaking company back to Yahoo. Make millions, great Indian <laughs> spirits, you know. No, seriously. That's why in the Silicon Valley, there's so many startups. Every kid wants to start start up, you know. Now, there are solutions and finally make a decision. So, so if this young man, right, is looking for a uh, daughter-in-law for his son, right, he saw a problem. Son's playing around with all the girls, we've got to tie him down, right? <laughs> I mean, tie him down, so the mama says, you know, right, let's find some girls. So they found five girls, but he can't marry all five, right? So he has to make a decision. So ladies and gentlemen, anybody engaged in change management better realize at the end they must learn how to make decisions. All the change is useless. So how do we go about it? We start with an objective. Then we find some candidate solutions, right? Whether it's to hire a person, whether to buy a car, acquire a company, locate a branch of it, doesn't matter what. But in future, Never forget criteria. Don't make a decision without criteria. Criteria are the ones that drive your decision. So now we have what I call C and C, criteria and candidates. So we need a process and we finally make the decision. You as a decision maker, you have three things to do. The number one is find out what are the criteria. What do you want in this thing? If you go to buy a car, you'll tell him, hey, I need miles per gallon, I need price, I need resale value, I need low maintenance costs, no insurance, whatever it is, right? 
Now, you also find out what the cars are. Okay, there's a Hyundai, there's a Kia, all of them. So that's your candidates. You'll find them also. But most importantly, you must interpret the data with your feelings. So there are things, the criteria, the candidate, and by the way, if I stop time, tell me somebody and I will stop. I never stop until you tell me to stop, right? So give me a five minute signal and I will stop. Yes, let's do it in five minutes. Five minutes, five minutes okay. We'll stop with this. Good, good timing, by the way. <laughs> so when you search for the optimal decision, there are two components. The quality of the decision depends on the data and information, the context information, and the creative options the solution technique and the decision maker's expertise. But the implementation requires a proper timing, adequate resources, commitment to execution, invariably changing circumstances. Will the circumstances change over time? So we don't know, it keeps changing. So ladies and gentlemen, we have quality and implementation. And the actual outcome depends on these two together. Right. You can make a decision, forget about it, nothing's going to happen, right? There's no outcome. But here's something you will not agree with me at the beginning, and you will agree with me later. Do not judge the quality of your decision by the outcome, and most people do at the top. Something goes south, something goes wrong, and you say, what the crap, man, what kind of decision did you make? Look, see what we did. No. It could be that the decision was perfect, the implementation was horrible. So, yeah, I, I do a lot of telecommunication companies, and I tell them as a good example, I said, you want to put a cell phone tower. The design engineers look at the soil conditions, wind forces, all of that stuff, and they design the whole thing. Then they find a contractor and give him to build it. That guy puts more sand and cement, you know, one to eight, one to five, whatever it is, and build it. Six months later, <coughs> is the problem in the design, the quality of the decision, or in the implementation? So you can't, you can't separate the two, right? So now that we've got there, one last slide. You as a decision maker have to deal with the guys who solve the problem, the information providers, they're different people, implementing people, even the people impacted positively or negatively, and of course the bad manager because he has the budget, authority, and desire. So ladies and gentlemen, you better learn how to negotiate. So that's one of my phrases is, every action is a decision, and every interaction is a negotiation. Okay, so we'll stop here and we'll take a break and we'll get back right on here. Okay? Don't disappear for too long. That means you get to go home early. Thank you. Yeah, maybe get back in 15 minutes. Awesome. Thank you.